You're listening to the Empower to Heal podcast. I'm your host, Dina T, and I'm so excited to take you on a journey through stories of everyday experts as we share the ways we've harnessed the power inside us to improve the quality of our lives and the health of our minds. We're so excited to have you here with us and hope you feel inspired and empowered to heal. Hello, you beautiful souls. This is part two of the episode about donating my kidney to my friend, Alethea Rodriguez. Thank you all for following along to this point. I sure hope you enjoy the rest of this episode. If you are hearing this and you are thinking about how powerful it could be to donate your kidney, I advise you to look up the Kidney Registry. It's the National Kidney Registry. You just go to kidneyregistry.org. It will be linked in the show notes below. And you can find out if you're a match for somebody you love, or you can enter in the database to be an altruistic donor, meaning you're connected to somebody as a match that you do not know. In addition to that, I also would love to share with you about the process for bethematch.org. It's my.bethematch.org, also linked in the show notes below, to become a bone marrow donor. This is a less invasive procedure than donating a kidney. It is also still a powerful way that you can save another person's life. All you have to do is to is go to the website and submit They'll send you a swab, you swab your cheek, you you mail it back to them, and then they will connect with you if you are a match for anybody on the registry, and they'll keep you in their catalog so that if you are a match for somebody in the future, they can contact you as well. It is a surgical procedure, but it's far less invasive then donating a kidney if that feels like a bit much for you. Alrighty, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of this conversation with my dear, dear friend, Alethea Rodriguez. And thank God you and I have the education we do. So we both have our master's in social work. Allie was like this pro who went through the medical track of her master's in social work. I chose the clinical track. So she's got more knowledge and expertise than I do. (laughs) But we both have spent enough time working with hospitals to know how to talk to social workers and case managers to get shit in gear, like move your butt. And And we did a great job. Oh, girl, high five. We were like, no, 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 no. I think I had, this took a couple of months of back and forth to get them to see that my kidney is fine and it can, it can be used. And Mayo Clinic was like, no, like it's completely fine. We're not doing this extra testing. We already did that testing. And they They said it to them again. Yep. And I think there was, I think it was probably a mixture of like faults from both hospitals of the I'm social sure, workers right, communicating right. of what they send or what they don't send. But of it course. came down to like, I was like, nah, we need to have a Zoom meeting. You and we did. literally had a Zoom meeting. We and really I was did. like walking out of swim class with my yeah, son, like getting on the phone, You're changing like him in the back of my car. There's like yes. your nurses on one phone. And I was like, you guys, you guys. <laughs> My doctor said this, like, you need to figure it out. I'm going to describe to you what the test was, exactly what it was, what they yes. said, like, you need to figure it out. And I think that meeting like helped Help. I think it helped. I think so too. And I think honestly, like I give props to, you know, Mayo Clinic and to UPMC and their teams for really working together and being flexible with us because they really could have been like, no, this is our policy. No. And they didn't, which is like, I'm so grateful for them. Like, yeah, we had to jump through those hoops, but like the fact that they were flexible with us and they actually heard us, it's amazing. Because think about it, when you go to the doctor, like sometimes you only see your doctor for 15 minutes and then they're out going on to the next patient. Mm -hmm. So to be able to have a Zoom call with a a team of, you know. I know. Like that's pretty awesome. I know. I think takeaway is from this point in the conversation, everyone, is you got to advocate for your own healthcare. If you believe in something and know something and understand something, like don't settle, keep on it, stay on top of people's butts. I feel like my social worker really, like I was like, you got to send this to them. Oh, I sent it to them. Oh, I forgot to send the code. I didn't send this password. I must've done it the wrong way. Let me try again. Then it was like, I was, 
I felt like I was her supervisor at times, like, Hey, what's the update on this? How did it go? How can we problem solve? Can I help you with anything? What can I make easier? Can you give it to me and I'll give it to them? Like, how could we bridge this gap? But you have to advocate and you've got to look for, you got to look for each way to bust down the barrier. It's like that barrier buster mindset. Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't feel comfortable, find somebody that will help you advocate for yourself. Mm. Because I know some people don't have that personality to be like, Hey, listen to me. Look at me. I'm here. See me. No, I don't have that personality that for my own self. Like if it was my own health, I'd be like, yeah, okay, cool. Thanks. And then I'd probably yeah, like, but you do it for your son, family. right? You do it for Michael. It's like you do it for other people. I, yeah, you know? I did it for you. <laughs> for sure. Hello. The Allie needed us. Yes. This is not okay. But right. then you guys also, when you get matched, so let's tell them what they test you for. Like, what do you have to match for? So we were match- like, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> You have to match blood type. So that's pretty much the number one thing. You have to match blood type. Um, and then other things they look at is age. I don't know that you have to be the exact age because we're not like, we're like three and a half years apart, right? Um, I'm 32. Okay, never mind. I'm 34. We're two years apart. <laughs> but anyway, so we're close enough in age that like, we not only were we a blood match, but then we're close in age. So it works out. They, they do test for a couple other things, but I think those are the two biggest thing. Because they did my this mom, like allele test, right? What was that? Yes. Allele or something? I don't know how to say that word, but yes, they test for all types of things and how it's like, how like, is you know, your body going to reject my kidney? How right. are our blood cells going to like, like react to each other? Or whatever? Yeah. Like, are they going to be more supportive? Could you, I take immunosuppressant medicine for the rest of my life, Mm -hmm. which everybody does when they get any type of transplant, right? Mm -hmm. But like, if we're a match, the closer we are to being similar, the easier it is for my body to accept this kidney and like not give it a hard time. Mm -hmm. Um, And your, what's your blood type? O negative, I think, or O positive, one of the O's. So the same, I, we had the exact same blood type, which I think is, they say it's like the most rare blood type too. Like we can donate to anybody, but to receive, you have to have that same blood type. So you were in this situation where you're like, like I could have donated to whoever the hell wanted it, but But I can't receive from anyone. Yeah. And I didn't even know my blood type before this process. I had gotten it like years ago when I donated blood, like in high school or something, but yeah, it's I, someone, one of the O's, O neg or O positive. I can't remember which. I still don't remember. Yeah, <laughs> I know it's an O. It won't be relevant again when I need more surgery and stuff. I don't know. But yeah, like my mom tried to donate for me, but she was like 30 years older than me. And they're like, yeah, mm. not, you're not a blood match, but also like, it doesn't make sense to give a person who's 30, a six year old kidney, because that kidney's lived its life, right? Mm-hmm. You want somebody closer to your age, because that gives you the longevity piece. And I will say like, kidney transplants and longe- longevity of transplants has come leaps and bounds, right? Like people used to get transplants and it would last five, six, 10 years. Now they're lasting up to 20 years, which is amazing, right? Yours so is going to last 30 years. We're counting on this. That's what we're going for. 30, 30 years. years, baby. <laughs> 80 years. Take we'll me just to keep the grave. Upping it. Add a decade every time. <laughs> hey, Dina, do you have another kidney I can have? Because, oh, no, you can't have my other one. I Sorry. grew another one for you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You can't do that. <laughs> uh, no, don't we wish, right? Like a little <laughs> right? kidney farm in your body. Like, don't starfish reproduce on their own. We need I know. Just like, grow another on limb. <laughs> <laughs> so we have. Um, questions. Yeah. Let's ask each other questions. I posted a poll and got some questions from you all that you want to hear about. Um, so I have questions and then Allie has questions too. And yeah. I think we'll probably talk about like recovery as well. Cause I'm sure people are wondering if they want to donate, like, what is yeah. that like? Yeah, we can really. share all about so, it. I'll just give you my, I mean, you kind of already answered my question. My biggest question for you is like, A, why did you do it? Which you've already answered. You felt like it was a calling from God, right? Like you mm-hmm. felt like it was the right thing to do. But my other question was, how did your family feel when they found out about that? Like, were they angry? Were they scared? Were they like, what the hell? Why didn't you oh tell us earlier? Yeah. So my husband um, was like, ha ha. <laughs> right. Yeah, right, Gina. <laughs> well, you <laughs> hate doctors. <laughs> You're not doing that. <laughs> um, and then when I told him he was a ma- I was a match, he was like, Oh. okay. Like this, like really like, okay. And of course he's scared to death. Like 
He's yeah, afraid. Wife. I mean, when I, when I was pregnant with Emery and I was going into labor, his biggest fear was that he was going to lose me while I gave birth. And which is scary as hell. <laughs> he was terrified of it. And then when I had Emery, they're like, so you lost a lot of blood. We're going to need to operate, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> And I ended up not needing to be operated on because I'm a stubborn mother, but um, <laughs> I, he's terrified of that. So he was very scared and yes. I did all of the things that probably scared him, but also created security. So I didn't have a living will organized. And so I'm like talking to lawyers, drafting up a living will going down. Like I'm go up to my office and fill it out. I'm like, so if I die during this, this is what I want you to do with my body. I want all of these organs donated. They can yes. take my skin as well. I don't care if you don't have Take any of me skin. left like right. leave my whatever <laughs> and yeah. he's like we're talking about this and I'm like yeah so he was scared he was so scared that he was gonna lose me um but he is the most supportive person in the universe and if anybody knows Michael yes. on this podcast like my man is like amazing oh, he's like the definition of love and um so he he was like okay we're gonna do this He's literally so pure. Like, I don't know. Like, you guys are just good people, right? But like, I just remember meeting Michael, and he's so cute and sweet. And like, we were I remember when, yes, yes. And I remember just thinking, like, wow, this guy is like real nice and like real cool and like chill. And like, he doesn't get like when he's angry, he's not like cursing you out, right? Like, he's like a normal person. <laughs> like, normal people exist. What is it? And I remember th- when you told me you were my match and when you were going to donate, I, that's the first thing that came to my mind. Like, what about Michael and Emery? Like, mm. are they okay? Like, is he okay? Like, is he talking to somebody about this? Because, mm. you know, we always, in situations like this, or like, you know, when somebody like loses a spouse or a child, like, we think about that, the mother or the spouse or something, but we don't think about those other people, right? Mm. So people automatically are like, Dina, are you sure? Are you going to be okay? But like, I'm like, what about your son? Like, you have a three year old, you have a husband. Like, what about those people? How do they feel? Right. Cause Jamie would have been like, uh, no, you're not doing that. I'm not going to lose you. <laughs> what the hell? You know what I mean? So yeah. that for me was the biggest thing is how did he cope with your decision to do that? I mean, obviously you guys made the decision together, you know, as a couple, but mm-hmm. you really told him like, I'm going to do this. We could talk about it, but I'm going to do this. So I think it's amazing that he was supportive of you, even with all those fears. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's, he knows me, right? He knows that he'll never get in between what I want and what I am feeling called to do. I'm one of those people where I set my mind to something like, watch out. Yes. It's coming in I'm hot. Coming. And yes. So he knows that about me and he's learned how to support me in that. And mm-hmm. I am like eternally grateful because I mean, he's my rock. He's the person caring for me. He's the person in my recovery. He's the person helping Emery. He's the person up with me at night, like dosing out my medications, like for recovery, helping with my pain, like taking me for infusions. Like he's my person. And so he was, he was amazing. And my parents were, um, shocked. So I didn't tell him right away. I told Michael like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. And I, he didn't take me seriously. And then I told my parents as I was already going through the process. Right. And, mm -hmm, And they're like, what? And I just told them casually on a phone call while I was driving to work one day. <laughs> hey, I just stopped at McDonald's for a breakfast sandwich. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to do my, donate my kidney to Al. You remember her? She signed a notary agreement for you once in college. You remember her? <laughs> They're like, what the hell? Dina? You're going to give an organ away? You haven't seen that girl in 10 years. What are you doing? I know they were shocked and I think they were afraid, but my parents aren't the type of people who are going to show me their fear. They're going to show me their support. So I am eternally, like I've been blessed my entire life with the support system that I have. And so that's, I mean, that's how they were um, when they found out. And did Emery even know, or was he just like, sure, mom, whatever, bye. I'm going to go um, Yeah, we told him when surgery was coming closer that mama was going to have surgery. And we explained to him what that means. And I think yeah. he was like, what? Because we said, like, they got to cut mama open and you're not going to be able to touch her tummy for a little bit. Yes. And like, mama's going to have big owies. So you, he's... He's the type of child who like snuggles me to no end yes. and he wants to like sleep on me. He so like do that, right? I'll put him to bed in his bed and like, I don't you. know, shortly after he's like on my face. Yep. Yep. 
and it, we had to prepare him for like the change of like, you got to sleep in your bed. Mama's going to have owies, but mama's okay. And right. even if you see mama in pain, it's a good thing. Like it's gonna I'm getting be better. Right. Yeah. We had to help explain that. Yeah. Um, he doesn't understand like, no, but he like, he knew something was happening. Yeah, he knew. And that was my first time away from him. So I am, yes, I I've you telling me never that. spent still to this day outside of surgery and being in the hospital after that. I, I've never spent um, a night away from my baby. That's so crazy, right? I know. I love yeah. So that much. was big for you too. That Yeah. He's your, he's like your twin is crazy. Um, that's like a big deal too, right? Like that's mm-hmm. like a grieving process too, right? Like I'm always with my child mm-hmm. and now I'm not going to be for one, two, three, four nights. Right. Mm-hmm. Like I don't know how long I'm going to be away from him and it was COVID. So it's not like you could just come visit. Like, yeah. It and it was lot. scary. Cause when, when, I mean, it's like saying goodbye to him before going into surgery is just right. kind of like, I love you and dear God, like, like let me make bring it. me back yes. to my baby. And, yeah, but um, that's real. That's real yeah. because surgeries, any surgery, there's a risk that you could die. Like, let's just be honest. Like mm-hmm. it's scary as hell, you know, even having a C-section, like that's a surgery. Like you could have major yes. complications including death, right? So mm-hmm. it's a lot. <laughs> it is a lot. It is. So yeah, that was their experience with it. Um, Okay. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm looking at my okay, list. I'm ready. I think I'm ready. Um, this is a question somebody had. <laughs> Did you have any weird cravings for foods that you normally didn't like, but once you got my kidney, you all of a sudden liked. <laughs> okay. So we've talked about this one before. So I have, I have two different foods. So the first one's garlic. I always like yes. garlic, but not to the point where I'm like, I could eat it raw, right? So I usually put like, you know, like one spoonful of garlic into something that I'm cooking and like, I'm good. Girl. So after my transplant, I'm like one, two, three, four. And my you can't use the like, spoonfuls of garlic. You got to use the fresh cloves. The spoonfuls are not strong Smash enough. Smash that. Smash it. Yeah, I got, uh, in Spanish, they call it a pion, pilon. It's like a mortar on puzzle. So I got that thing. So I'm like, yeah. I got to grind it down. I'm like, that yeah, garlic I'm going. Yeah. I am okay. a garlic lover. Like all yes. things garlic, garlic yes. infused olive oil, garlic in every single dish mm. I have. Garlic lovers, like seasoning goes on every single food I make. Yes. My breakfast, lunch, it. and dinner. <laughs> I don't know about maybe eggs. I literally put garlic lovers on my eggs in the morning. Yeah. Well, that's like my new seasoning blend, right? Like if I'm just making something like if I'm just baking chicken, I just want to have a little salt, pepper, garlic, onion powder. That's something, right? There you go. That's my trio. Like salt, garlic, pepper, and onion powder. Yeah. So the other thing was fresh, like vegetables. So like, I've never really been like a veggie lover, but like I started wanting like kale, spinach. (laughs) And like zucchini, I'm like, who am I? Like, I still don't like pickles, but the zucchini, I'm like down with it now. So it's interesting. I've become like this healthier eater. I mean, I don't know. It's crazy. I think you got my food palette. Like, Maybe. well, the good part. You got the good parts of my yeah. food palette. How do you feel about meat? I don't really like meat. I'm not okay, a big meat so eater. I've been on this kick since the transplant of like, I think I want to be vegan. Like, yes. Like I like bacon. But yes, like, I will always like bacon. Yes, but everything else, I'm just kind of like, mm. and like I can't even eat eggs anymore because I think about what eggs are, and I'm like, Ew. I know. You think about what eggs are. I, I went through this whole phase of not eating eggs because That's I where was I like, am. Mm, I think you got some. I don't know if this is like See? like scientifically possible, but I I prepared that kidney for you. Like you I sure went did. on. Like literally yes. you guys, I went on a sugar detox and cleanse. I like yes. cleaned my body of candida, which is like a, I think it's a yeast that eats sugar. And okay. so I like went completely sugar free, decreased all of my fruits for a long time. That's I was crazy. eating every breakfast. I, oh my God, I, I made that kale eggs. and egg, like omelet thing. Yes. I, I would put kale and spinach and eggs in an omelet. And I like I like, as soon as I, I felt the calling to do this, I was like, you're getting a freaking vegetable filled. <laughs> yeah, I, I sure did. And it, it's carried on. Cause I've been into it. I've had like, yes. I went to Aldi the other day and bought like kale burgers. I'm like, who are you? Kale burgers? <laughs> like, who are you? So yeah, that was my diet change. I definitely had a change. I love it so much. Cause you know, that's a change for the better. If you eat beef, tell me if you want to die. Cause beef makes me like want to pee. I can't really do ground beef. Like no. I can do like steak or like a stew. I can't like, do ground st- beef kind of gets beef. me like 
I used to like beef. I can't do any beef anymore. Yeah. I'm like, I eat chicken cause I know I need the protein. And so like yeah. I eat it, but yeah. I'm not like mm. the only meat yeah. that I'm like, give me is bacon. <laughs> yeah. Cause bacon is amazing. Right. It's awful, it but it's so delicious. It's so good. Yeah. No, I've been more like less away from meats. I still am okay with bacon, but like other meats and like animal based things kind of freak me out. So yeah. yeah. What's your next question? Um, okay. <clears throat> what for both of us or for uh, you? what was it like when you found out you were a perfect match oh we kind of talked about that Amazing. i know i love awesome. that we were a perfect match in every way we didn't talk about the alleles but like we had zero percent of anything identifying that that like they're they test to see what percentage of risk you are for like yeah. for Allie to reject Receive. my kidney yep. and we had zero risk zero like crazy? it was like the best score you could have absolutely perfect blood match I was like this was just God this is a God thing it's just crazy it's crazy I mean I just go back to like you know grad school like I was gonna go to Temple in Philly and they never returned my like they never said if I was approved or denied and Arizona State had accepted me. So I was like, I guess I'm going to Arizona. The first day of classes, we actually ate lunch together. And they, Temple called me and was like, hey, we'd love you to start our program in the fall. But I was already in Arizona. So it's crazy. Like, if they would have called me earlier, I never would have went to Arizona. We never would have met. Like, it's just so crazy. But, yeah, finding out we were a match was, like, so fucking awesome. Like, it was just no. so awesome. I got the call while I was in a medical office and I like was like, what? And I like freaked yeah. out and I was like, I need to step outside. Yeah. And I like squealed like a pig yes. squealed. And then I called you like, ah! I was like, what is going on? Are you okay? <laughs> Pretty sure I was like crying laughing. Yeah, that was awesome. I cried because that was just like so amazing. Like everything about the process was just amazing. Not dialysis and not all the other bad things, but like you being willing to do this and then us being like a perfect match like that's some crazy stuff. i credit that to god man holy moly batman yep yep mm -hmm. i'm with you this episode is brought to you by one world empowered hey there tired mama do you wish you could push a reset button on your energy like do you want to keep up with those energizer bunnies that are running around you all day? I know, I know, I know. I feel ya. Coffee can only do so much. Well, don't you worry. I've got you covered. Now just imagine a community of mamas who know the struggle and are working together to harness and reclaim their energy. We're talking about a true community of mamas who get it. Daily practices to jumpstart your days, accountability partners, group coaching calls to ground and recenter you throughout the 28 days. Does this sound like the exact dose of medicine you need in order to feel 100% again? If so, this program is exactly what you need if you want to be more present with your kiddos, if you think a new routine will help you maximize your time and you enjoy having an accountability partner to help you with developing that new routine and those new habits, if you'd like to increase your patience and energy all while reducing your stress and anxiety, and if you think it would be amazing to have an understanding community of mamas who get it and are on the same path towards healing. Mama, today is the day you choose you and level up. Come join our 28-day energetic reset for moms by visiting www.oneworldempowered.com slash work with me and click the learn more option next to the energetic reset program or just scroll down and click the link in my show notes below. I can't wait to meet you and witness you step into your full potential. See you there, mama. Okay. Um... We already answered that one. Okay. How has your life changed since the transplant? For me, I, I would ask you the same question. So for me, I'm like, I'm not as tired. So mm. I can like go to sleep at like 11 PM and be up at seven. No problem. Where before I'd have to be asleep at like nine to be able to be up by eight. Right. Like I needed mm. like a full 12 or more, you yeah. know? So for me, I'm way less tired. Um, COVID, I think this is a hard answer question to answer because like COVID has not helped. Like with COVID and after the transplant, I really couldn't go anywhere. You know, like not only should I, I couldn't be around anybody, but Jamie and my mother for like the first month and a half, two months. 
And then after that, with COVID, I was just so scared to go places. So I'm like, holy crap, like I just had this mm. gazillion dollar surgery and you just went through all of this for me. And like, I don't want to risk losing that. So I think some of my anxiety actually peaked and got worse mm. because I was so nervous about fucking it up for lack of a better word. Like I was Aww. so scared. Um, I think it's better now and I'm more motivated now to like get in shape and do things like that. So I think it's hard to answer that just because of COVID being involved, but um, yeah, I'm definitely not as tired and like, I don't, I don't want to say drowsy, but like sluggish. Like I, before yeah. I felt like, yeah. Ugh. Ugh, like I'm just a slug like I don't want to do anything yeah like, I would be like tired all the time so it's mm-hmm. it's definitely changed my life for the better I think it's made me um appreciate things more like mm-hmm. I appreciate little things more um so yeah it's interesting and it's made me more conscious of my health because you learn so much when you go through this process about like how dirty plants are and how dirty animals are and like you know you don't think about that stuff when you don't have to take an immunosuppressant but when you have to make these changes you're like oh man like oh and also like I'm not allowed to take eat pomegranate star fruit or grapefruit which I don't like grapefruit but now I feel like I really need to eat the other two because (laughs) I'm not allowed to have it (laughs) so what about you how did your life change after after my donation (laughs) Yeah, that's me. Oh. All of a sudden, I need pomegranate juice, and I never really eat pomegranates before. Pomegranates are amazing, though. Uh, so my life, how has my life changed? Um, well, I don't know. Um, I didn't give much thought to this question because I thought you were going to just answer this one. But so I we think- can come back to it if you want. No, it's okay. I'll answer it. Um, I think it's been a progression. So after I donated, I'm going to share a little bit about recovery. Um, so I donated my kidney and I woke up in the recovery room and well, before that I was in the operating room, I woke up in the operating room convulsing. And I remember looking up and seeing a doctor, they were trying to ask me a question and my whole body was like trembling and I couldn't focus my eyes. And then someone said, um, give her and then insert name of medication that I don't recall. (laughs) And then I was out again. And, um, that was like, I don't know if like I was supposed to be waking up at the end of the surgery or what was happening, Right. but, um, that moment scared me so much because it reminded me of when I was little, uh, and I had in high school, I had like a seizure from a medication they gave me. Yeah. And, um, and so after that, I, they, they wheeled me out into this recovery room and it's like post-op recovery room. And this is in the middle of a pandemic. And so typically you'd be able to have a family member come and see you or support you. And this whole journey, me being deathly afraid of anything poking me or being invasive was really scary. And I was like tearful and afraid. And I woke up and I was in so much pain and we couldn't find a pain yes, I cocktail remember that. that worked. It took a long time. Oh, and the awful. nurse that I had was, I think she was upset or flustered or stressed out, not with me, just in general. Yeah. And I remember she was really sharp with me and I'm emotional already. But and you just had your kidney removed. So. I'm like waking up from surgery and I'm like, <laughs> and so um, I remember like, just like be on your best behavior, Dina. And I was like, may I please have a different medication? And I like used my best manners that I could conjure up in the moment. Like, and like, may I please have some water? And I couldn't move. And I was like, Miserable. I just wanted my mom or my dad or my husband. Like, yes. And so we had a lot of, um, a big journey of trying to find the right medication. And they took me to my room after we found something that worked for a few hours and they, did they do this? Like they probably did. They put you in this like little like hammock thing, like your bed, like you're in bed and they need to put you in a different bed. And so they like lift you up in this hammock. Yes. Sway That's called a Hoyer lift. So I didn't have that. I don't, I don't remember if I had that, but that's a Hoyer lift. So they do that with people who like, yes, who they're afraid to move too fast or like somebody who maybe is like large and they can't oh, move them yeah. like by themselves. So yeah. I was yeah. like, what's happening to me? Yeah, put me down, please. I want my mom. 
just save me. Why did I do this? <laughs> but yeah, then I was in the the room and I didn't really eat. Um, I, I had uh, pudding, I think was basically the only thing I ate while I was in the hospital for those few days. And my nurses were so kind, but they, I have a um, super low blood pressure. I don't know if you know this, Allie, but I, oh. I have something called orthostatic hypotension. And I think this played a really big role in my recovery, but my blood pressure is very low and it takes a while for my blood to come up to my head. And when my heart races, I'll lose my vision. And I discovered this in my I don't know, mid twenties. I think I came, like I developed it and I used to be active. I used to horseback ride. I used to like rowing on the lake, rock wall climbing. And I lost my vision on a horse. I lost my vision rowing in the middle of a lake and you can get ejected when you're rowing because you're rowing on a team. Yes. And so like I, all of these things started happening to me. And so I know now how to control it. Like I don't let my heart get too high. I lay down and put my feet up. Well, my blood pressure was really low. I was like, I think my, so you're supposed to be 120 over 80. And I was yeah, like 40 over something that's when so I was recovering. Scary. And I, so it was a fall risk and of course, trying to like get out of bed. And like, I got to tell you, the nurses are like epic. Like, yeah. I think nurses are angels they are. and so these amazing. nurses were the most beautiful souls in the universe. And they like, take me in my y'all you have a catheter in when this all happened oh, so I was yes. in the hospital with a catheter oh. they take me and they put this strap around my waist under my arms they hold on to it and tie the strap to them somehow they gave me a walker they grabbed my pee bag and so they're holding my bag of pee and they slung it over their shoulder and I'm like wonderful <laughs> yeah thanks for that what's happening and they're like helping me walk and at first it was like standing up then getting to the door and then going out and they kept me an extra day because it was a pretty rough recovery yeah um and so recovering was hard um I I came home afterwards and due to my blood pressure it was really difficult I thought I got COVID because my lungs I couldn't breathe um and so I went to the urgent care, um, and my that. lower lungs collapsed is what that's they call crazy. It. it sounds scary, but I guess it's really normal when you have surgery and go into anesthesia. That makes sense. Cause they put your arms up and they tube you. So sometimes you get gas and stuff. Yeah. That makes sense. I, I didn't think know. about that. That's scary as hell though. Cause if you don't know, you're like, what's wrong with me? I know I couldn't breathe and like standing up would take my breath away and like Ooh. walking a few steps. I would like Little start thing. to lose my vision yeah. and I couldn't see. And so it was a really rough recovery and I wasn't expecting it to be like that. Um, no, not, I thought pain, but I didn't think about, I didn't know about that other stuff. So that's yeah, the pain was ridiculously a lot. They like Jesus. pump you full of air and you're, did you get the shoulder pain? Yes. Always. Oh. I like, get that almost every single time I'm intubated. Like, oh. and you don't even know what it is. You're like, why do I feel so weird? They said like, it's gases. Yeah. They said it's gases. They fill your body up with, with air. Yeah, I guess and- I'm caught. Yeah. yeah. It hurts so yeah. bad. Yeah. Um, yeah. so y'all it's real. The recovery is freaking real. But after I got my lungs into shape, I had to get some steroids to get my lungs going. Yeah, and I got off the pain meds pretty fast. Cause I you did faster than me. You were like, I'm done after like a couple of days. And I was like, Oh my God, I'm in, I like, I couldn't even sit down or stand up without feeling like I was going to die. It was, it agony. hurt so bad. I was afraid though. So they had me on fentanyl. Yeah. And I um, know people who have overdosed and died from fentanyl. And yeah, so I have like, a, yeah, psychologically, I have a bad relationship with like, yeah, yeah. the thought of using that drug. Yeah. Um, so I was like, I'm getting my butt off this. Yeah, but... you did a great job. Not me. I was like, I'm going to take this until there's none left. Like I would take like, I think I started at like three a day and then whatever I was on at first didn't really work. Like it wasn't taking away the pain. So they gave me something else. Yeah. And I remember like, the last couple of pills I had left, I was like, okay, I'm only going to take them at night. And then I'm going to take Tylenol during the day. So for two nights I did that. And then the last day came and I was like, oh my God, I'm going to break it in half. I'm going to take half of it and one Tylenol at night and then save the other half and a Tylenol for the next night. Cause I was I like in you. so much pain, but like, so let's talk about this. My kidney is in my stomach. It's in the front of me. You're where so they weird. took you out is from where? Okay. So my scar is, um, they made a scar. It looks like a C-section scar. So I didn't have a C-section, but it's like right above my pubic bone. It's really low. I have one there and then they go in with three 
Yeah. What's it called? Laparoscopic, Lapar right? Laparoscopic. Yeah. They're like little camera needle thing. Yeah. So I have three little itty baby incisions on my right side. So they go in right. there and then they take the kidney out above out my through. pubic bone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have like scars in different places. Like mine literally mm -hmm. starts probably like a hand below my chest, maybe two hands, depending how big your hands are. Mm -hmm. And it goes down like this and it crosses my C-section scar. Mm. So it's like a big J almost. Oh so my I think gosh. That's a yeah, it's important for people. I would show you, but that, you know. <laughs> um, so I think it's important for people to know, though, like when you get a transplant, when you when you send your kidney away, you get different like surgery sites than when you receive your kidney. And, and the I had put, the option of two different surgeries. So like, yeah, a lot of people and I think there's actually three variations, but my doctor only did two. So they did the one right above the pubic bone, which I opted mm -hmm. for because you can like not see it in a bikini. Um, they do one where they say a lot of males opt for this, but it's like a straight line um, under your belly button around it and then up it a little bit. So that like it, uh, it can follow the ab line kind of. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then they do some on the side where it's like, like a full blown like J that would make sense to me yeah. yeah that's what i thought yours was going to be like on your back but that's interesting that they have like man healthcare no. and technology right magic i know but yeah pain so like that pain was i won't say it's the worst pain i've ever experienced but it's probably second place like it's really i mean and because my at least the way my scar was it was like my whole torso so I felt mm -hmm. like, oh my God, I'm going to die. Like, cause I know. You, you don't realize how much you use your abs mm -mm. until like you have a surgery in that area. <laughs> and then you realize I'm in therapy, physical therapy right now, because I, uh, I don't think I told you that because I have, um, I have your body overcompensates, right? So yeah. you're not using your ab and they, they make sure you don't use your abs. Like they're it's so hard. Yeah. But it's because you could have a hernia or something. Hernia, there's the word. Um, so I overcompensated. So my back muscles got really strong and my ab muscles got weak. And now I'm retraining how to oh use my, my ab muscles, yeah. my like different like muscle groups that you don't even think about that right. kind of got Locked. atrophied or right. whatever you want to call it yeah, because yeah, that makes sense. you like couldn't use them for so many weeks and then I didn't right. realize it was a problem until, until it started causing other problems in my life right. and so um you have to be really conscious and I think you got to be aware when you're donating a kidney or receiving a kidney like be gentle with yourself in the process but then how are you supporting your body and coming back together because it's different and your body yes. operates different my yes. my hormones have been affected from this and so i am like um one is like losing the i don't know how to describe this so <clears throat> weight around my stomach i've never really had much of a stomach i mean i gave birth mm -hmm. and um i have a crap ton of of stretch marks, but right. I've, I've not, ever you were never, really you've had, always like, been flat in your stomach area. Yeah. I've had like a thinner stomach, but the bump of my stomach took forever to go away. And I still look at my stomach sometimes and I see it there. And I think yeah. it's to do with hormones, number one, Probably. but my hormones have like really changed. And so I'm actually doing a hormone detox right now and oh, um, going through later. testing for my hormones. I know. Yes. So yeah. That's crazy. But you yeah, have I lost a lot of hair, so maybe mm. my hormones were affected too. Yeah, I, they, they would have to be, right? Your adrenal glands and yes, yes, you have a functioning mm. kidney. Like your body doesn't know what to do with that. It's mm. like we've <laughs> never had this before. Like your kidney's it's functioning so at like sixty-nine to eighty percent. Like what? Yeah, what was your percentage? You texted me. It was like three percent, right? The day of surgery. Yeah, yeah, lower. I think it was three percent. Yep. So I even had a point where I had like point nine seven function like it was so low but yeah I think I was three percent of surgery to have transplant you have to be below 10 I think 10 percent to be put on the registry I can't remember there's a number you have to be below um so yeah it's crazy it's crazy that like I'm functioning at double what I was before I got pregnant so before I got pregnant I was like 30 28 and now I'm like 69 to 80 depending on the day because those numbers fluctuate mm -hmm. but yeah my numbers That's are amazing right crazy and you're, it? it's so crazy we found out your kidney connected right away right like yes i didn't have any issues i really haven't had any issues like recently they've changed the meds but i think some of that has to do with like gaining the corona 30 
you know, gaining some <laughs> weight. So they've been like testing meds, but you know, I started with having to have blood work two to three times a week and then once a week. And now I go every other week for blood work. So I'm still wow. closely monitored. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. They don't do that same type of monitoring. Like, so yeah. when you donate a kidney, you have Oh God, I wish my brain was better. Uh, my memory, but you have like, I think it was like two weeks post-op month post-op six months post-op and then year post-op, but it yes. was like the six month post-op appointment. I didn't go to Mayo clinic. I just got my blood drawn at a local, cl- like a local and place fine. and they sent yeah. it in. And, um, my one year they tried to schedule it early and I was like, no, mm-hmm. like wait till the anniversary. Don't try to play me. Right. Yeah, I want to find out what On it really the 25th is. Or after. It's like yeah, the the real date. Um, and I'm coming into Mayo this time to get it done, awesome. but That's I haven't so cool. seen, yeah, I haven't seen my nephrologist though, since two months after my, I think it was you two, two had weeks, issues, two weeks after. Right? No, That's I just went to awesome. urgent care for my lungs and everything. Okay. Oh, I, I went back in, I think at my two week appointment, they did an infusion. Um, yeah. Just to be sure. I think I had to have an infusion as well, like a couple of days after transplant, but I don't remember what it was, uh, I want to say magnesium, but they, they really do watch you well. And I think, mm-hmm. you know, I know some people have this thing with doctors, they don't trust them at all. And like, you know, you, like you said earlier, you like a more holistic approach. Mm-hmm. I think that a lot of doctors who do kidney surgeries or they're nephrologists, they have experience and they have a team. And I think, you know, some of it is you have to trust them yeah. and that's hard. It's hard to trust that like other people, they have literally had their life, your life in their hands. You do have to trust them. And I, <clears throat> you have to trust people you've never met, right? You don't know all the people in that operating room doing Mm -hmm. this. I don't know. Yeah. Shout out to my surgeon though, Dr. Leedy. She did an amazing job and your kid, like I'm only five one and you're like what? Five, six. Uh, Yeah. Five, seven, I think five, six. Like we're like not the same height. So they're like, they told my mom, she's so tiny. That kidney's going to take up her whole (laughs) body. Oh, I love it. It was that so makes funny. me so happy. <laughs> right? But so it's been good. It's, it's been a bumpy ride, like you said, but I think overall, I'm so mm. grateful for you for doing this. And I'm so grateful to be able to live. You know, literally, I take bazillion medications and I do everything I, I need to do to keep this baby alive because I want to be able to live and be happy and, you know, do something for someone in return as well, you know? That makes me feel so happy. I love your just your gratitude around it. And I think when you do this, you have to know, like, you don't know what the outcome's going to be. Sometimes right? you donate a kid. And I had to ready myself for the reality of that. Like I might donate my kidney and your body might reject it. Yeah. I might and donate like, my kidney and yeah. in five years it's, it's lived its life. I might eat yeah. Like there's these things you have to come to terms with, like, yeah. all right, like we're doing this with no conditions attached and psychologically you have to prepare. Like, I don't like, I love you, Allie. I don't care how you live your life. As long as you live in a way that makes you feel happy. Right. Thanks. I'm going to go do some cocaine after this. See you later. (laughs) I care about that. Don't do that. (laughs) Don't do that. No, no, I, I appreciate that. I think that, and I see that a lot in the group that I'm in, like I donated my kidney to them and they're not even taking care of their body. And it's like, you're not you have to do this out of a place of completely, there's no conditions attached. Like this is your life. This is your body. This is your opportunity to experience however many days, months, years that you can in your body and your life, how you want to, and the way that makes you feel like you. And that's that. Right. And like, that's a big, I think sometimes that could take people like going through therapy to get to a place to understand that. I would agree because think about it. Like you did this huge thing for someone and like let's say they just go start doing cocaine and drinking and not giving a shit and it's just like wow like I did this super selfless thing for you and you don't even give a f- any shit right <laughs> like you're just like okay I'm good bye like that would be frustrating right mm-hmm. so I, I get it it's such a weird thing to think about. I had to like, I remember talking to my supervisor about that. And I was like, the only thing I've really got to figure out for my own mental health is if it doesn't work. Yeah. How am I going to feel? Yeah. If I give you my kidney and that doesn't work. And I remember when I woke up in the post-op room, you were already in surgery and someone came and told me that you peed on the table. And I was like, what does that mean? And they said, as soon as the kidney was connected, it worked. I peed. I was ready. I was like, yes. And so our surgeons were talking to each other. Like it makes me grateful for them. 
right? and their flexibility. Like, I'm so grateful that they did this for us, you know? Yeah. I'm so grateful that you can fly in Oregon on a commercial flight <laughs> yeah, for real. with a GPS tracker Girl, overnight. A part, a part of your body and now my body has always flown one more time than we have. Right. Whoa. Like, we're always being like one that. more flight ahead. <laughs> yeah, these are the things I think about. I love it. I remember when they told me that I was like, nobody's what? going with it. Like that's what I thought too. I was like, why somebody steal it? Have it on the black market. <laughs> we're all paranoid. Pray my kidney makes it. Like, yeah. Let it make it there and let it work. Amen. <sighs> Oh, my dear. Well, thank you for coming on. Did you have any more questions on your list? No, I think it was a good conversation. And I learned a lot about your experience. I'm sure you learned a lot about mine. And oh my I gosh. hope this helps somebody who, you know, is thinking about it. Or, you know, if people have questions, they can always ask you and we can answer them a different way later. I mean, I, again, I just appreciate you so much. I always have. I think you've always been an amazing person. And I just love you to pieces. And I'm oh. so glad you're in my life. A little Allie, dinky. I That's what your mom too. calls you. What? <laughs> your mom calls you little dinky. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Leave it to you to use the nickname. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love you, Allie. And I'm grateful for you. And I'm glad that God put our lives in the, like, our paths crossed and yes. gave us the signs and the symbols. And I don't know. I think it. It, it took us being open to listening to the universe to you saying, I'm going to post this on Facebook right. and like every hey, world. step of the way. I yeah. just love it. It's magical. And I love you. And thank you for like coming on the podcast and talking about it. This was like yes. really vulnerable for me. I'm still sweating a lot. <laughs> just let it out. Just go take a bath later. <laughs> I know. Right. Okay. My well, dear. I love you. Thank you. I love you too. Bye. Bye. Thank you so, so much for tuning in today. I hope you are feeling inspired and empowered in your own healing journey. I know that many of you listening might be reflecting on your own stories that you may feel called to share. If so, please reach out to me at dina t at empowertoheal.com. That's D-E-N-A-T at empower, the number two, heal.com. Or drop me a message through my Instagram handle at empower the number two heal. I would love to connect with you and learn about your journeys so that we can hopefully continue to spread these powerful life lessons on empowering ourselves to heal. My contacts will also be linked in the show notes below so that you can easily find me. We are so eager to start a movement in showcasing the many ways we can heal. And you can be part of this movement too by capturing images and tagging them hashtag empower the number two heal on Instagram. We look forward to seeing all the ways that you are empowered to heal. I love you beautiful souls and thank you so, so much. Please be sure to subscribe, like, and review. 